Okay, welcome to uh, just the introduction to bronchoscopy. So we won't get super detailed into all the medicines and all the different things here, or indications or contraindications or anything like that. We'll just go over the main basics, and then hopefully we'll have some time, especially in disease class. Hopefully that we'll be able to do some time in the lab where we can actually run through just the basics of what a bronch looks like and the setup uh, as well. Okay, well, let's get started. So bronchoscopy is basically the um, direct visualization, uh, using an instrument for direct visualization into the bronx uh, to sort of see where something is or what something looks like. And it allows us to also sample material as well as remove material. So it's diagnostic and therapeutic. So we're using a camera um, to usually look and if we need to retrieve something like a sample or material then we can do that or even insert something like a one-way valve or a stent or things like that so that's something that we we have a lot of flexibility with here um, so one of the things that we're looking at is just used to inspect the airway when we did a lot of organ donations uh, for patients one of the things that we would do with donor alliance is we would do a bronch and the bronch was to look at the airways directly, not with an x-ray, not with a CT scan, but directly to see how healthy that tissue was. And sometimes that x-ray lags behind on disease pathology, and we'll talk more about that. But what we're looking at here is something that actually sees, is this lung tissue healthy? Is it viable? Is there something weird growing up in their lungs? Uh, should it be transplanted or not, right? Should their lungs be a viable source for someone else or not? And so this is something that we can use to inspect the airway. Um, when we th suspect someone has um, coughing up blood for unknown reason, let's say they're negative for tuberculosis, but they're, they have hemoptysis and they're coughing up something weird or we see something abnormal on their x-ray or they're not responding to antibiotics for a pneumonia, then we might need to go in to sort of see what's going on. So we're able to inspect the airway and get samples. Removing objects, either foreign objects or natural objects. Um, natural objects could be like uh, tissues, tumors, things like that, that could be growing into the airway, things like that. Or natural things like, hey, someone aspirated a peanut. Or foreign body objects like, hey, someone aspirated a uh, piece of Lego, right? Or a piece of nightlight or whatever it is. You'll see a whole bunch of different things, but removing foreign objects um, or natural objects can definitely be an indication. It's more of a therapeutic, uh, obviously, that's a therapeutic thing to resolve that situation. Uh, collect samples, we already talked about this. We can get a number of different samples. Uh, if we're looking for lung cancer, we can look at doing um, an EBUS, an endobronchial ultrasound. And I have a picture at the end there sort of talking about that. And that's where we use an ultrasound and we drill a hole into the um, the lymph tissue and we get that sample and you'll put it onto that little sample onto a slide and hand it to the pathologist in the room and they'll be looking for things like that. So there's a lot of different type of samples that we can collect. We can collect BALs where we take the edge of the scope and we wedge it as far as we can down into their, uh, let's just say right lower lobe. We wedge it as far as we can down into that bronchi and we push 120 ml of saline, we aspirate it and we might only get 30% back of what we push in there, but we aspirate it and then we know whatever is going on that right lower lobe that looked weird on their x-ray, we can run that BAL, we can run that fluid that we just aspirated from there and see what's going on. Is it growing a fungus? Is it growing something else that we weren't able to catch, right? And that's not something you can see on an x-ray usually. Um, we could also do cytology where we get a brush and I have pictures of all these things in here where we get a brush and we just brush up against something that's in the airway and we can send that little brush. We wire snip the edge of that brush off into uh, sterile saline. We label it where we got it from, like right lower lobe, and then we send that to the lab and so they can run cytology of it. Or if there's something protruding into the airway and we want to get a tissue sample like a histology, we can actually grab it with forceps and rip it out. <laughs> Not the whole thing, just a sample out. And then we'll take that little sample that's in the forceps and we'll pick it out and we'll put it on uh, in what's called formalin. Uh, this is very important that you put it into formalin for a tissue sample, and then that's taken to the lab. Of course, you're going to mark it wherever you got that sample, right lower lobe. Usually, it's right upper lobe, but um, just using right lower lobe for an example there. 
So remove uh, foreign objects, collect samples, and then place the devices like a stent, a uh, one-way stent uh, valve um, that they can use for people that have emphysema. And there's more information out there than, and I don't want to go into it too much here, but that's pretty much stopping those blebs or those big pockets of gas that can stay in there. And we're just sucking out air from that diseased tissue to ultimately help their lungs function better. So it's pretty neat overall. So in the picture here, you're going to see um, this person, they're lying on their left side dependent, and they have what's called a bite block in place. Um, that bite block it helps people prevent from biting down on that scope. Now this is a flexible scope, as you can see. Right, it's a flexible scope, and the big thing about these guys is they're very, very expensive, and they're very sensitive. There's a bunch of fiber optics in here, and if this patient were to bite down and they did not have that bite block in place, it's thousands and thousands of dollars to get those fiber optics replaced. So here you see the screen that they're all trying to stare up up here, and if you start to see these little black dots up here in the airway, I know these aren't black dots. But if you look through a scope, and our, all of our scopes at PMO are broken, uh, but you'll be able to look through them. You'll see black spots. Well, that's broken fibers, right? That means it's been damaged or pinched or something like that. So they can be used to place devices as well. They can also be used for cryotherapy. They can be used for a number of different things. So diagnostic and therapeutics, so this just sort of breaks it in between diagnostic and therapeutic uses. So diagnostic uses, removing a foreign body. Uh, we could remove a foreign body. Uh, that could be diagnostic. Why is this kid having trouble breathing? Well, we can go in and remove that. That's therapeutic and diagnostic, right? Then we know for sure, hey, it was like a piece of a light switch that this kid uh, aspirated or a piece of a Lego or you name it. There's so many different things that will happen with these kids. Uh, to obtain a sample for a diagnostic, this is where I put eBus in here. And that's usually when we're looking for lung cancer. That's where we'll go in with the, the bronchoscope that has the ultrasound tip on it. And we'll look for lymph tissue and drill into that lymph tissue through that wall of the airway. And then we'll, set, we'll literally uh, take that sample and you'll be in the room with the pathologist. You'll put the sample on a slide for the pathologist and the pathologist will run it. Um, so that's just one of the things that we can do is eBus. But we also have the options of BALs and brushes and forceps that we already talked about. Uh, there's even something called a bronch wash, where instead of wedging the scope like you would for a BAL like we already talked about, where you wedge it as far as you can go, this one, let's just say you're in the trachea and you see a ton of secretions, but you want to get a sample of it to send to the lab to grow for a culture, then we can do what's called a bronch wash. And so they'll just uh, suction, right, in the main airway. So it's not specific to any lobe or segment or anything like that. And we can send that as what's called a bronch wash. Uh, so it's not specific to their a lobe or anything like that. When we're looking at therapeutic indications, foreign body removal, of course, if this kid aspirated something, which is why you have that picture in the background of a little child, what do you think they most commonly have these issues going on? Well, it's probably aspirating a foreign object. Now with this kid, you're also going to see this kid's trait. And so that that upper airway surgery, if they're doing upper airway surgery, this is a rigid scope. We'll look at both the rigid and flexible scopes. They might be doing an upper airway surgery on this kid uh, as well, instead of just removing something. So we'll talk about both the rigid and the flexible. So this, this scope here that you're seeing is attached to a ventilator. I hope you guys can see this. There's this little side tube that they can go down. They can look down and they can remove, they have these wedges, they have these forceps, they have all these tools that they can go in and do a bunch of upper airway stuff. So odds are this has something to do with this kid's tracheostomy too. Well, the cool thing about these scopes compared to the flexible scopes is you can hook a ventilator up to them and they can ventilate the whole time while they're doing it and it's not going to really disrupt their breathing much at all. So they won't have the uh, the side, the bad things that can go on with their ventilation while they're using this. That's why they sometimes call this a ventilation scope. So this is attached to a ventilator circuit. You can see the end tidal CO2 wiring attached to the back there, and then obviously the circuit goes back down to the anesthesia machine that's back there. Uh, so the kid can actually ventilate during the whole surgery while they're doing the upper airway stuff. Now this kid is paralyzed. You can see the eyes are covered with the 
tape. They really tape the eyes closed when someone's paralyzed, and I hope you guys have gone over this before, to help prevent from corneal abrasions. So whenever we chemically paralyze someone, we'll tape their eyes shut on purpose. That protects their eyes. And then this thing on this kid's forehead, I believe that's a biz monitor. Uh, I could be wrong on that one, but I believe it's a biz monitor. And it measures sort of their level of conscious, because this kid could be paralyzed, but still be conscious. And so a biz monitor sort of looks at their level of conscious or their brain waves, a rough way of looking at their brain waves. Um, and so we could sort of see how well we're doing with sedation on top of paralyzation. So there's a couple things going on in the picture. I just wanted to point out like a rigid scope and looking at some of this stuff. Um, so therapeutic removal of foreign bodies or upper airway surgeries, um, things like that. Intubation, of course, we can put the ET tube, the endotracheal tube over the bronchoscope. Now we're talking about a flexible scope, not a rigid scope like you see in that background picture. But we could put it over the flexible scope and we could actually visualize the airway and going through the cords and we could actually get the right depth of insertion. It even talks about this in your Egan's text. We could even get the right depth of insertion with the bronchoscope. And the cool thing about intubating with a flexible bronchoscope is A, um, not only do you get to see directly that you're in the airway, B, you can actually put perfect placement because you can measure how far away the tip of the tube is from the crina. Now, according to Egan's, you want the tip of the ET tube one to three centimeters above a crina on an adult. And so you can actually measure that there too. And the other thing is if this patient has any issues while you're in there, if the pulmonologist is intubating with this bronchoscope, they can go in and collect a sample. They can go in and get stuff um, or uh, lots of secretions that have developed in the airway. We can go in and get that stuff sucked out Why we're in the airway to begin with, as long as that patient is stable there. So you can use it to intubate. So, and also you can use it to verify tube placement. So we had a patient uh, one time come in and it was a child and they were intubated in the field and we didn't know uh, if the ET tube was placed in the right place because they were doing compressions. And so it's very hard to get their CO2 levels monitored because CO2 uh, is a sign of perfusion. If the perfusion's poor, especially if they're doing compressions, you may not get a readout. So we had the anesthesiologist put one of the disposable bronchoscopes into the ET tube to verify that there was some sort of airway present that we were actually uh, uh, tracheally intubated. Um, so that's one of the things too, you can verify tube placement as well. Um, so, and then the other thing too is procedure wise, when we're placing a percutaneous tracheostomy, like when we're doing a tracheostomy procedure, we're actually gonna use the bronchoscope and this one's a rigid scope, but you can sort of see that light right there on the kid's trach. And so when you're looking at this, you can see that there are lights there, and you can see if the trach is centered or if it's sort of angled left or right, like a 1 o'clock, 11 o'clock position. Um, so we can actually use it to make sure that the tracheostomy procedure is going in at the right angle and that they're doing it at the right spots in their airway and also monitor their airway while we're doing it. Thermoplasty. Thermoplasty is where we can go in for patients with severe severe asthma and so we can go in and we can actually they do one lobe at a time they just don't do the right middle lobe um, so they do one lobe at a time and then they'll go in very deep and you guys can search for this on on your own and I won't hold you to it just so you know what it is we'll go in very deep and we'll heat up these little sensors at the end of the probe and these little uh, sensors will heat up to about 44 degrees centigrade what that does is it'll demyelinate that smooth muscle that constricts with bronchospasm. And so that means the next time this person's exposed to an allergen, let's just say they have allergic asthma, right? So the next time they're exposed to whatever triggers their asthma, their bronchospasm won't be near as severe because those muscles get stronger and stronger and stronger the more exacerbations they have. So this helps actually relieve that bronchospasm so it's not near as severe. And there are hospitals, including in Colorado, that do this procedure. So bronchothermoplasty or BT is one of the things out there. Uh, stents and one-way valves, National Jewish is one of those ones that do this as well. Um, they do the one-way valves, especially for emphysema. We'll talk about that later on in disease class. Okay, so looking at the airways, I put this picture in here for your benefit. I won't make you guys 
memorize this picture or anything, but I thought it was really neat to sort of see what the different areas will look like on the bronchoscope. So as you go down, and the first area you're going to see is the bifurcation of the trachea, right? So this is what you're going to see. Well, how do you know which is the right side and which is the left side? Well, that's where you're going to have to look for your tracheal rings. If you have all your tracheal rings up here, and then it's just smooth down here, right? You have your tracheal rings off to the side here, and it's smooth down here. Well, this would be your tracheolus muscle that's smooth down here towards the esophagus. So that means this is the right side and this is the left side. So you know which side that you're going down. So it's important that you identify the anatomy because if you don't have that, the camera could be upside down when they insert the scope, depending on the angle of the person uh, running the scope. And so you could actually, even though you go down that side that's on the right, it actually could be their left main stem. You won't be able to tell the angles when you're going down usually. You have to identify their anatomy. So if we go into the right upper lobe, this is where you see uh, the bowling ball, apical, posterior, anterior. Hey, this is where knowing the segments come in handy because guess what? they are gonna have to figure out where you're at, especially if you're labeling samples during this whole procedure. So that's what you're gonna look at in the right upper lobe. You can see those three segments, the apical, posterior, and anterior. Then you go into the right middle lobe, um, and then you can see the, the three segments that are in there. Uh, so two segments, and then and you get to the right lower lobe. Uh, bronchus intermedius is in between the two. Uh, so that's where you see the entry to the middle lobe, and then they go into the middle lobe in this picture. And then you're going to look for your right lower lobe where you can actually go into all of your segments down there or see all of your segments and get a sample from down there. A lot of times you'll have a right lower lobe pneumonia that you'll be going in to grab a BAL for. And so you'll wedge the scope. You'll take this, the, the tip of the bronchoscope and you'll just wedge it until you see the airway turn white around the scope. And then you're going to push a bunch of saline, suck it back out. Send, label it, send it to the lab. On the left side, obviously you're going to have your upper lobe and your lower lobe. And so you'll see your basal and your uh, left upper. So the one of the ways that you'll know in your left upper, because um, it's 224, right, for your left upper or Asia Alps, if you're doing your whole segments over here, is if you see cardiac oscillations and you only see those two, then you obviously know that you're in the left upper lobe. Uh, left lower lobe, usually you won't see those cardiac oscillations on, but I thought this was a good visualization picture for you, just for reference. So two different techniques for bronching. You have your rigid scope and your flexible scope. Now we already talked a little bit about both of these, but this just sort of compares the two um, overall. Most commonly, you're going to be looking at the fiber optic or the flexible scope. Uh, in this situation. Most of the time when you're looking at a rigid scope or a ventilation scope, so these are AKAs, they might say, hey, go grab the fiber optic scope, or hey, they might say, go grab the ventilation scope. Those are just synonyms for the rigid scope and the flexible scope. So when you're looking at this, the rigid scope, let's talk about first. It's more common in the operating room, and it's usually run by thoracic surgeons and otorhinolaryngologists, right, your ENT doctors. So they're usually doing something more upper airway, um, some sort of surgery, neck surgery, different types of things that they'll be using it for there. So it's not very common that you'll be assisting with a rigid scope procedure. Um, even when we have a little kid that aspirated something and we need to go in with a rigid scope, usually it's not the RT assisting, usually it's anesthesia. Uh, and the surgeons that are running that whole situation there. So thoracic surgeons and ENT are your gonna big, or big ones here. Uh, flexible scopes, usually this is gonna be your pulmonologist for the most part, and then surgery can also do this too. Now we even had an infectious disease doctor that was getting trained to do, um, to do bronchoscopies because he was also credentialed as a critical care intensivist. So other people can have credentials to do bronchoscopy, but they have to have credentials to do bronchoscopy. You cannot have someone that does not have specific credentials to do it. So let's just say I had a dermatologist that we consulted for infection on a patient and the dermatologist says, I wonder if this is in their airway and wanted to bronch the patient. Well, unless they had specific credentialing, 
to allow them to do that unless it was in their scope of practice even though they're a physician they still have to have credentialing or that scope or that skill accounted for so you need to make sure whoever's doing it has that skill accounted for but these are just traditionally what you'll see so thoracic surgeons ENT for rigid uh, pulmonary so pulmonologist or critical care intensivist um, surgical uh, doctors, a lot of surgery doctors will also have this as well, especially when we're talking about tracheostomy procedures, percutaneous tracheostomies, it's going to come in handy for them to be able to do a flexible scope or a fiber optic scope. Um, so with a rigid scope, it's just the long open metal tube with the light at the end of it, and you already seen a picture of it, and I think I have more in here. The only <laughs> goes... Oh heavens, it only goes as far as the bronchi. It's just the large bronchi. It does not go very in depth into the lungs. So you're not gonna be going to the right lower lobe. You're not gonna be going to the left lower lobe. So you're not gonna be able to get that detailed view of those distal airways. Cool thing, this can telescope with mirrors to see some segmental bronchi. So you can still look around a little bit in there. You're just not gonna be able to get as close up, um, especially grab samples into the deeper areas of the lung tissue. Um, the cool thing, one of the great things and benefit, major, major benefit here, is you can uh, suction a lot of really thick, tenacious, large mucus plug secretions. So someone with aplastic bronchitis, right? Google image aplastic bronchitis, right? You're going to see these giant mucus casts that look like lung tissue that they had to pull out. A lot of times these won't come out with fle flexible scopes. Now it sort of depends how bad it is. Sometimes they have to go in with the rigid scope to pull out these giant mucus plugs. So that's a big benefit of this guy here is it really can get those. And the grasping forceps can remove foreign body objects. So that's the, one of the big benefits and indications usually. Or airway tumors uh, in the large airways uh, especially. So there's, there's a big, big ben benefits here with removing foreign objects and biopsying uh, large airways. Plus it also, like I talked about before, it can ventilate the patient very, very well during the whole procedure. When you skip, uh, skip to the flexible scope, you're going to have something obstructing the airway. It does not have a ventilation channel as part of it. And so you're going to have an issue here where now I'm taking up, let's just say, half of the patient's airway diameter. Well, as you know with Posey's law, that makes it the gas flow turbulent. It's going to make the work of breathing harder. It's going to make uh, a lot of issues for your patient. And so you can have ventilation and oxygenation issues as well for your patient. So the rigid scope is really good at making sure that the patient's well ventilated and oxygenated during the procedure. Uh, and like I said before, very good at removing large objects from patients. So kid aspirates a toy, a micro mini <laughs> car, right? That's something that the rigid scope would be a lot more effective at removing. When we're looking at the fiber optic scopes, the one of the great things, and this is why you guys will be seeing it the most common, is you can access the small airways a lot better. So this is one of the things that we'll use to go look at the right lower lobe. Why is this pneumonia not going away? Why is there atelectasis that's not resolving? Why does this patient have a fever of unknown origin? Well, let's go in and get a sample and run it for a bunch of different things, right? Why is this nodule in the lungs? Uh, so let's, let's go in, get a sample, hey, and run it for a bunch of different things. So we have access to very small airways, which for diagnostic purposes can be very, very beneficial. Uh, there are three channels. You have your, I call it the lights, camera, action. <laughs> you have the, the flashlight part. You have the camera part at the end of the scope. And then you also have the multi-purpose channel, and that's what it's called because you can use it for suction. It's very, very small and very tiny. It's smaller than, I think, a 14 French catheter. So it's like very, very small. It's not going to remove a lot of thick, sticky, tenacious secretions. It's not designed for that. So it does have a small channel that you can use for suction. You can also use that channel um, to put, um, so it's used for suction. You can use it uh, for tissue samples. So this is where you put the brush, the biopsy brush, the forceps, um, your tools, and I have a bunch of pictures of the tools um, as well to really get this patient, whatever you need to get from this patient, you can go and sample um, as well. Uh, the other thing, you can use this if you need to for some low flow oxygen administration. So this is like when we're going to intubate <coughs> with the scope. 
If you go to intubate with the scope, you can actually hook oxygen tubing up to the suction port or the multi-purpose port, right, where you'd hook suction up to. And you can tell the intubator to press the button for suction. And when it does this, this allows for oxygen to flow through the bronchoscope. So when they intubate with the bronchoscope, they can actually give oxygen during that. Here's the thing, that channel is so small, that multi-purpose channel is so small, that oxygen administration through the channel cannot be high flow. So you're only going to be able to run it for a couple liters a minute. We're not talking about 10 to 15 liters a minute here. All right, so you can use it for some oxygen, just not the most effective way to use it. The Q versus the T scope. The Qs are going to be your classic diagnostic scopes, and then the T scopes are something else out there. Uh, and their their scope numbers will start with a T or a Q, and that's how you'll sort of know there. Um, the Q scope has a little bit smaller of a multi-purpose channel and a smaller outer diameter. The T scope has a larger multi-purpose channel in a larger outer diameter. So you cannot use a T-scope in a six and a half ET tube, right? You cannot use it in a small airway because uh, it will be very, very hard on that airway. But if we need to remove something large and they have a large ED tube, or if they're conscious and they're not intubated, then we can use that T-scope because it has a lot more ability to get bigger uh, instruments so we can have a better chance at getting out what we need to get out. So the Q versus the T-scope, that's just something for you guys to look at at your facilities, what they're using. Some of them may not have a T-scope. Some of them may just only have Q-scopes. And remember, bronchs can also be done on kids. The cool thing about kids, uh, bronching with kids, their bronchs are so small, but um, the bronching itself is not going to be able to remove secretions because the bronchus is, is small itself. It's not going to be able to suction very well, but the cool thing is you can sort of see if there's inflammation versus secretions in, in that airway, and you can modify your procedures where if it's inflammation, then we're doing more inhaled corticosteroids or systemic steroids. Uh, if it's more um, secretions, then we can up our, our different airway uh, clearance management techniques there. So it's going to be very helpful therapeutically to look at those type of things too. Uh, pulmonary and surgery, like I said, are going to be usually your ones that use flexible scopes. Um, and then two subcategories within the flexible scopes are going to be native airway versus artificial airway. Native airway bronx is when you have a person that does not have an artificial airway. So usually we'll go through the oropharynx into the, into the trachea. Um, sometimes we'll go through the nose depending on the doctor, but most of the time we'll go through the oropharynx and we'll just put a bite block in so that we don't destroy the scope if they bite down accidentally. Uh, artificial airways, if that's going through an ET tube or a tracheostomy tube into their lungs. Obviously we don't have to worry about a bite block in a tracheostomy tube patient because if they bite down it doesn't matter because the scope's in their trachea. But even if they have an ET tube in place, and we're going through the ET tube, they could still wake up, bite down, and bust the scope. <coughs> so that's something that we have to look at with the artificial airways, as well as make sure you're using a bite block unless you're going through the nose or going through a tracheostomy. Use a bite block. Uh, so the ARC does have clinical practice guidelines on flexible scope. I won't make you guys know that here, but you will in critical care. So downsides of a rigid scope would be that it's very uncomfortable for conscious patients. So usually they have to go under general anesthesia for this procedure. So that requires an anesthesiologist, requires an operating room usually, uh, and it can't get to the smaller airway. So those are some big downsides. Uh, when you're looking at the flexible scope, can definitely impede ventilation. And that's going to be one of our major issues. So it can definitely impede ventilation because this one does not have a ventilation part to it. And also if we're sticking it down an artificial airway, we're going to take up a large diameter of what's inside the patient's airway. So it's going to make it very hard for them to ventilate and oxygenate during the procedure. Uh, may require extra oxygen during maneuver 
That's going to be one of the big things. You're going to have to usually get them on a lot of nasal oxygen, as well as possibly modifying a device like a non breather mask to allow for the bronchoscope to go through the oropharynx and give them high flow oxygen during the procedure. One of the things I did is take one of these little suction uh, mouth oral suction things, ones that look like a little straw that you can bend, and I would hook up oxygen to it and I would put that in with their bite block and so I would give them continuous oxygenation right to their oral pharynx as well uh, besides the nasal oxygen. And usually that did pretty well where we wouldn't have to put them on a non breather. Um, if your hospital has oxy mask, that would be perfect too. These scopes are very, very prone to damage unless you go through the nose of the trachea. Very, very prone to damage, so uh, always use a bite block. If you see butt docs in there, it's most likely the patient bit down and destroyed some of those microfibers. They're not really good at foreign body removal. They do an okay job, but uh, as far as foreign bodies go, if it's in the large airways and it's a foreign body, the rigid scope's going to be your best bet there. There's a lot more technique with the flexible scopes. That's going to be how you twist the scope because the scope only goes forward and backwards, right? So you're just going to mess with the aperture on the scope and it's just going to allow the tip to go forward and back. And that's about it. So you have to rotate the scope as well as go into some extreme angles to get into different parts of the lung, especially the right upper lobe, which is hard because the right upper lobe is where most of the times you're trying to find out what's going on up there. The most common location for lung cancer is going to be that right upper lobe. So a lot of times when you're doing this for diagnostic procedures, that's what you're going to have to be dealing with there. Uh, so a lot more technique, and it usually requires an assistant, as this is a two-handed maneuver, so you're not going to see a doctor usually doing a flexible scope by themselves. Usually they have someone that hands them the tools, the suction catheters, the different types of things that they're going to need, and that's where we come in for the most part there. So here is just a computer animation of a rigid scope or a ventilation scope. So here you're going to see the, the ventilation side where we hook the ventilator up to it. And then you're going to see a multi-purpose channel that we could go in and we can grab samples, remove things, all that good stuff. Obviously this is not a good neck position to be in. So that's going to be something else that we have to look at is their neck mobility. Do they have a fusion? Things like that. But remember, these patients can't be conscious during this, so they got to be under anesthesia for the most part. Here's just a different picture that I put in here. This is where the doctor is looking down the scope, and sometimes it'll also be on the screen as well. And you can see how they're using the multi-purpose channel here to put stuff down there. Um, and this person may or may not be hooked up to the ventilator. It might be just due to a slight upper airway thing under light anesthesia there. But just sort of you sort of see if you see one of these, you know it's that rigid scope. Now we had to use a rigid scope. Uh, we had a patient, an adult patient that was trached, that had aspirated a bridge of her teeth uh, into her airway, and so we were trying to get it out with the flexible scope. And as you know, uh, the flexible scope isn't the greatest, especially when you're dealing with something as massive as a bridge for her teeth and so eventually one of us I don't remember if it was me or the other RT in the room suggested to go get the rigid scope and we went down to the OR and got the rigid scope and we were eventually able to go grab uh, that bridge out there with the rigid scope but the rigid scope really is going to be a benefit to you uh, just seeing it and then if you are able to go see some rigid Bronx procedures get in with anesthesia right see if you could get in to see some of those procedures they're pretty interesting When we're looking at flexible scopes, this is the brushing versus the biopsy. So brushing is where we put this little histology brush down there. And you're going to put it down that multi-purpose channel. And you're going to see whatever it is on the side of the airway wall. And you're going to be like, okay, we need to take a sample. So you're going to put this brush down there. And you're just going to move the brush forward and aft, right? Forward and back. Uh, so you're going to agitate it. Sort of like uh, when you make tea, right? You have to agitate the bag in the in the in the hot water. So you need to agitate it to get a good sample that gets a lot of those those cells onto the brush. And when the brush is taken out, you need to have wire snips, and you snip off the tip of the brush into 
a little vat of saline. So normal saline. Uh, you do not put it in sterile water. Sterile water does not go anywhere in a bronchoscope procedure because your body will not reabsorb sterile water that well, and so therefore you will cause a drowning. So whenever we're using this uh, normal saline, your body will reabsorb, even in your lungs, it'll reabsorb normal saline. That whole salt part makes a big, dif big difference here. So you're going to snip the brush off and put the brush into the normal saline and then label it uh, wherever you got the sample. Right, like let's say you got it from the right lower lobe. So label it. Uh, biopsy is a little bit different. We're gonna take forceps here, and we're gonna actually grab tissue, and we're gonna tear that tissue off from the wall. So we'll go to the multi-purpose channel, tear the tissue from the wall, and then when it comes out, you're not gonna snip it off or anything. And in fact, you reuse this one on the brushes. You have to get a new brush and a new brush and a new brush every time you want to do another brushing. But with a biopsy, you're going to clamp it, you're going to clamp whatever is tissue, and then you're going to rip it out of the airway, and then you're going to pull it through the scope, and then you're going to have to put that little tissue sample that you got, you're supposed to pick it out with a toothpick, and you put it in, so this is a biopsy, and this is going into formalin. So this go that little tissue sample usually we put it on a piece of foam then we put that piece of foam with all those tissue samples and we'll put it on a bat of formalin and then of course we'll label it right lower lobe or wherever we got it from and we'll send that to the lab so if it's biopsy you put it in formalin if it's brushing then you put it you snip it off and put it into normal saline always label it where you got it from Obviously, you'll use a patient, patient label with this as well, but these are just two different things that you'll see out there. Be careful with both of these. You can cause airway trauma, of course, especially with biopsies. Let's say there was a lot of blood flow behind this. <laughs> you can easily tear uh, a lot of blood flow, and uh, let's say this was in the left upper lobe. And there's things up in the left upper lobe like the, the aorta, pulmonary artery. You can tear a hold of those things, the patient can bleed out pretty quickly. So that's why we have epinephrine and things like that, so we can hold pressure with the scope and then push a vasoconstrictor if we start bleeding pretty profusely there. And this is just sort of what it looks like internally when you have that brush out. And this is the airway wall, and they're just trying to sample. Just a tissue sample of what's going on here with, with, with cells. So we'll grab that cell sample. When you take it out, you're going to snip it off with some wire snips, put it in some normal saline, label it. So that's just what that's looking at there. All right, so these are all the different airway tools that we can use during this whole thing. So first top, down here in your left lower, you'll see these long forceps. These are used during the rigid scope. So they're very, very long, and they can get very uh, big things from deep in the airway. Uh, especially the upper airway. So that's one of the big advantages over here compared to these forceps. Now this is a picture of the forceps. Now this is a larger picture, but this is a regular picture. The forceps are a lot bigger with the rigid scope than they are with the flexible scope. And so that's going to be one big advantage of removing airway stuff there. So here you'll see they also have forceps. They also have these things that when you retract, these things will move together. They will add duct and then they'll clamp down on whatever's in there. And I have some pictures of that. Forceps will clamp down, especially on tissue samples. Uh, snares. All right, this is a snare. You have to hook it up to an electrical machine. Usually the OR has this one, so we have to go borrow it from the OR whenever we have to do a snare. And then you just give it electricity, and then it, it it's just like a lasso with a cowboy, right? It's just the lassos, whatever might be in the airway that we want to grab. This thing here is also something that we can grab large materials with, and I have some pictures of that coming up as well. <coughs> All right, and so this is just a different picture of it. The idea is just to entangle whatever large object that's in the airway into this, and not necessarily retract it, obviously, back through the scope, because here's the scope itself. Do you think you're going to be able to retract a giant mucus club, club clot? through that scope. No, so the idea is to grab it, 
and to pull the whole scope out right with it still you know outside the edge of the scope now here is a picture over here where I went over to where just the scope picture was here's an airway adapter so we can do it through a bronchoscope we can do it uh, on an intubated person so it's just a little one-way valve it allows the scope to go through the one-way valve and uh, that way they're still getting ventilation during the whole time of the procedure now I put these two here <coughs> one of these goes into the airway and if we're gonna grab a tissue sample one of these has a little point to it so you can see that this one here has a little point to it on the end of it a little spike in the middle so when we go to grab that sample it really gets a good grip on it and then obviously we add duck the uh, the the jaws there and it really grabs a big tissue sample be very careful with both of these whenever you're doing the forceps big chance that you could have an issue with bleeding that's why we like to have epinephrine available to push down the scope if we can all right so here you're going to see some different things as well i put these in here here is those um ones that i was telling you about before where you put them out and it's sort of like those three prong things at the at the store or or whatever video game place you used to go to where you go down and you can actually grab like a whole different thing it's like a, a big big prong there here are the snares you can go down grab something uh, so you just loop around it like a lasso you hook it up to that little device that just gives it a little bit of electrical energy that grasps it and then you pull the whole scope out with whatever foreign body body is there here is those little like thing that look like a whisk that's what you're looking at here so the idea is to entangle something in there and then you can have a lot better grasp of it to pull it out like a penny or whatever it is in this person's airway so this is that basket that's what we're looking at here is that basket and ideally you're gonna go past it and that's what it's showing here you're gonna go past whatever object it is with a scope and then you're gonna deploy the basket while you're past it so they're deploying the basket here in letter D and then they're gonna pull the scope back and as they pull the scope back the idea is that it's gonna catch that giant mucus plug to the point or penny or whatever it is to the point where you can pull it out or fish it out of the airway pretty crazy then over here is a basket pretty straightforward here uh, the, the netting and the basket are gonna be some of your better airway retrieval things that you can do with a flexible scope the basket comes out obviously you can't retract it but the basket comes out uh, and then you can scoop uh, any foreign things that might be in their airway as well so there's a lot of different retrieval options here some of them are great some of them will work better than others sort of depends on what object you have if you need something that has better grasping something that will go around an object something that will grab an abnormally shaped object right something that can really get a good out there now a lot of these you're going to do better using that T scope rather than that Q scope so that's something that we'll have to look at at what facility you're at and what your pulmonologist prefers so the procedure itself you're going to be looking at pre-medication so IV access is going to be your big thing here conscious sedation is where most of this is done on when we're looking at the fiber optic procedure that's the one we'll focus on here equipment containers brushes forceps needles um, needles especially for drawing up your your lidocaine so you usually use four percent lidocaine for your neb uh, two percent lidocaine you'll instill anywhere above the vocal cords and onto the vocal cords and then anywhere below the vocal cords for the most part you'll use a one percent lidocaine so lidocaine is a numbing agent and should, should help reduce irritation and anything like that that's going on there um, you'll also use um, uh, formalin obviously for if you do the 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 forcep samples uh, wire snips if you do the cytology the brush samples right because you snip those into normal saline large volumes of Lucan's trap so there's where here's the suction coming off the bronchoscope you guys see that there and here's just the camera right so what you're gonna do is you're gonna connect the Lucan strap which is this large column thing that has a suction port you're going to connect it there and you're going to connect this suction to the edge of there so when the the physician whoever they are applies suction and that's what you see them doing there if they're applying suction then that sample of wherever they're at will then go and be collected 
into this Lucan's trap. So once they're done collecting that sample, that's when you'll take this out of line, you'll reconnect the section back up to them. So that's one way of getting a sample through this scope as well. Now he's not looking through the eyepiece here. Traditionally we have eyepieces and you'll see the ones at Pima have the eyepieces. But now this has a little camera and that's why you see this extra thing coming off of it down here. Um, we can connect a little adapter to the old scopes where now they can see it on the big screen. So that's why this guy's looking at the big screen. He's not just being negligent. <coughs> Overall. Um, so large volume Lucan's traps, that's what's going on there for, for sampling. Sharpie, why do I want a Sharpie? Because whenever we grab a sample, this room will inevitably be dark. If you've never seen a rock before, it's dark in those rooms. Uh, and so that's going to help you label the sample. That's where you can label it right lower lobe, left upper lobe, so on and so forth. Um, slip tips, slip tip syringes, a uh, bunch of a uh, large volume, at least two of them is what I would get, either a 30 or 60 ml in a bunch of like 10 ml. So I'd usually get about five to 10 or so in there, depending on who the doctor was. And most of the 10 ml syringes are gonna be for either giving normal saline to wash out like secretions that get off the tip of the scope during the procedure or for infusing uh, lidocaine during the procedure. So there's a multi-purpose channel uh, that you will put the, the scope and the multi-purpose channel is right here below their pinky. So it's right there. It's hard to see in this picture, but that multi-purpose channel is right there. And so that's where you'll put the tip of the slip tip. If you do a lure lock end to the, um, and you guys can Google image lure lock and slip tip syringes, um, the slip tip will go right into that multi-purpose area where you'd put the instruments as well, but the lure lock will not. And so you need to have that slip tip that's on there and we can go over that in the lab as well. Saline, you don't want sterile water. Sterile water does not belong here. Remember, we don't want to drown our patients. Uh, suction, of course, we want at least one suction for the oral and then one that would hook up, of course, to the bronchoscope. So at least two to three suctions. <coughs> uh, bite blocks, especially if you're going through their mouth at all, then we'll go through their mouth. Uh, even on patients that we were traching, I'd still put a bite block in there. With the trach procedure, we paralyze them. A percutaneous trach procedure would paralyze them. So I would still put a bite block in there, but that's where one you see may or may not put a bite block in there. Uh, but if they're going through their nose like they are in this picture, in this older picture, you don't have to worry about a bite block usually as much because you don't have to worry about them biting down on the, t on the uh, scope itself. Uh, adapter, if they're on the ventilator, we already went over that in that previous picture, that little one-way adapter. We have to put in place some gauze, especially if we're going to be using like things like lubrication, which should be under equipment uh, here, and it is airway preparation. Um, you're going to need that gauze there, uh, especially if the physician, right, you're going to want to put some sort of lubrication, whether it's viscous uh, lidocaine or something like that on the scope itself, and that's going to allow it to move up and down the airway without causing as much trauma on the airway. So usually viscous lidocaine was one of the things that I didn't mind uh, suggesting. Um, some docs just want water soluble uh, lubrication. That's fine as well. But that that uh, if it gets gooey or they have trouble manipulating the scope itself, then you, you're going to want some of that gauze as well just to help uh, clean off stuff or anything like that. So a bunch of two by twos, and of course labeling, patient labeling, especially if you're going to send anything to the lab, which most of these you will, you're going to need some labels. Uh, airway preparation, oxygen devices, especially there, this guy's on a nasal cannula. Like I said, I would always hook up one of those little oral suctions to oxygen and put it in their oral and their oral pharynx with their bite block, because most of our docs, except for one, you went through the oral pharynx for these procedures. <coughs> And that would allow for continuous oxygenation. If you're putting someone on a ventilator, if you're bronching someone while they're on a ventilator, then you're going to turn the ventilator to 100%. <coughs> In the adult world, we're going to turn to 100%. And we're also going to increase, increase their peak pressure alarm. Um, and then we'll go over that in in uh, critical care techniques, but we're going to make some changes, but you want to make sure that they're on a lot of oxygen because you're taking up parts of their airway with the scope. So nasal cannula, sometimes you'll have to put a non-rebreather or an oxy mask or something else on them as well. Lubrication, we already talked about that. Things to thin secretions, usually you'll have, I believe it's 20% 
um, muco mist or acetylcysteine. Uh, so that's direct installation via the bronchoscope. So remember, it degrades the disulfide bonds. That's why it smells like eggs, right? It smells like sulfur. So it degrades the disulfide bonds and thins out that secretion. And so that will help get any giant mucus plugs tamed down to where it can suction through the scope. So something you can put in there. Uh, they also talk in your NBRC world about giving the patient atropine in the airway. And the idea there is to reduce vagaling and it'll also dry secretions up as well. So helps reduce any vagaling parts. Uh, remember the crina has a lot of vagal stimulation, a lot of parasympathetic stimulation in your lungs. That's one of the things you have to be concerned about. And then something for vasoconstriction. So one to 1,000 epi is what we got, but we would dilute it to one to 10,000 epi. So when you, if you are doing a bronch, right? Let's say you guys are at clinicals and they're doing a bronch and someone starts bleeding massively and they did not have epinephrine with them. You could still use the same medicine from the code cart. You can use the one to 10,000 concentration of epinephrine from the code cart and you just have to draw it out of the code cart syringe. You have to draw it out of the epi syringe. Um, so there's a way to do that, which you guys will cover in ACLS down the road, but you can still use the epi that's in the code cart. Just draw it up, put it into a slip tip, and then you can instill it directly to help stop the bleeding that's in there. Uh, monitoring, you're going to want to share their on cardiac monitoring. So at least a 3 lead EKG, pulse ox, make sure you're cycling their blood pressure because they're going to be getting some drugs that could drop their blood pressure as well. Or if they get stressed or something like that, they could have hypertension. So hemodynamics could be a little bit all over the place. Um, make sure they've had no food or water for the last eight hours. You don't want them vomiting and going into the airway and causing aspiration. You need to make sure they're wearing protective equipment, right? Make sure you're wearing uh, mask, goggles, gloves, gown. Now this person is not wearing uh, goggles. And it's a big mistake because sometimes, especially when you're pulling the scope out of the airway, secretions can fling and then if you're not wearing at least glasses, <laughs> Yeah, that's a big no-no. So I always had fake glasses after I got my laser surgery done. I had a fake pair of glasses that I wore when I was at the hospital. I still have them just to help protect my eyes during all the bronch procedures and things like that um, as well. So they need some sort of face shield with it uh, that includes coverage over their eyes. Um, so this person not quite got it down, but they're definitely at risk for themselves. See, they usually wear the gown. Lots of secretions can fling, so you got to be very careful there. <laughs> Ventilator settings, we already talked about this a little bit. 100% um, oxygen is going to be a big thing if this is an adult patient. So pre and post, we'll have to make sure we can titrate it down to whatever FiO2 they were on pre-procedure. Uh, but during the procedure, we'll put them on 100%. <coughs> we'll also adjust the peak pressure alarm, so that way they'll ventilate during the procedure. We might even change their mode of ventilation. It just sort of depends. When we're done with the bronch, usually we'll put them in semi fowler's position. Uh, the bronching itself may cause bronchospasm, so we might need to give them a nib after the procedure as well. If they're bio if you did a biopsy during the procedure, we might have to get a X-ray just to make sure there's not a pneumothorax, because literally you were tearing a hole in their lungs. So chance of pneumothorax. So that's something that they'll usually order for those patients. Make sure you clean up all your equipment. Usually we'll suck enzymes. It's called enzymatic. We'll suck it through the bronchoscope. Um, we'll also wipe it down. Us, we were lucky enough to get um, our sterile processing department at Swedish to take care of the, st the sterile processing of the scope itself. But we would make sure to have it as clean as possible before we get it to them. And then they would take care of it from there whether they were um, using ETO, ethylene oxide, for a pediatric scope, or they were using something else. Um, that would be more depending on which scope they had going on there. So document, that's going to be the, one of the big things. Uh, usually the physician tells you what the samples are run for, whether they put in a, a, a order uh, or fill out an order sheet, or uh, put an order through the computer for the lab. You need to make sure you have everything documented, which lobe, which segment, uh, so on and so forth. 
Um, so make sure you get those samples to the lab after this is all done. But like I said, after the procedure's done, you don't just leave the patient, even though they have nursing staff and all that stuff. They could have bronchospasm. They could have some significant respiratory difficulty after this whole thing. So be ready, right? That patient could now have a pneumo. That patient could now have a severe bronchospasm. This doesn't mean you get to leave the area just because the procedure's over. So what could go wrong? So this is uh, what we talked about a little bit already. Uh, over sedation, obviously, we can give them Narcan if we give them narcotics. Uh, we might have to intubate them if they stop breathing, things like that. <laughs> Atelectasis, obviously, with sticking something in the airway, do you think they're going to get all that gas? Especially if we're using suction. You think they're going to get a lot of gas to the deep parts of that lung? No, so they can develop atelectasis after the procedure. Um, which is interesting because atelectasis, proceed, uh, residing atelectasis or, or continuous atelectasis is actually an indication for a bronch procedure. Why are they atelectatic? Is there something in their airway, right? So it's fun that it's an indication and also something that could happen. Exposure to a pathogen, especially if they did not clean the scope right, or you did not clean the scope right if you're at a procedure where you clean the scope. Um, so the previous patient, especially if they had something really, really bad growing in their airway, now you just expose this next patient to that same pathogen, so that could be something there as well. Uh, exposure to uh, cross-contamination, right, if it was cleaned wrong. Um, pathogen 2 can also be, let's say this patient had something like uh, tuberculosis, <laughs> right? Now everybody in the room has been exposed to this because that sort of pulling everything out of the airway, flicking around, right, as much careful as we are with it. Uh, can really expose a bunch of people. Uh, pneumothorax, we were talking about that, especially if we're grabbing forceps samples or if we're coring through tissue with an ebus. Hypoxemia, something's blocking the airway. Bronchospasm, especially something irritating the airway. Hypercapnia, hypercarbia, same thing. Uh, that's where something's blocking the airway, so not, not as much CO2 can be removed. Uh, bleeding, of course, especially if we're grabbing samples. Uh, air trapping, big, big thing, because now we have something that's blocking exhalation, which is the bronchoscope itself. So if you have someone that has severe auto peep, severe air trapping, uh, that's something you have to consider before you're doing this. The other thing, too, with bleeding is before we usually do this, we'll check something called an INR. And an INR is looking at how, what their likelihood is of bleeding. The higher it is, the less likely we are to do a bronch procedure. And so... If it's an elective procedure, we're going to wait till the INR is low. So let's say they had chronic AFib and they had a high INR. We might have to wait uh, till later on down the road. Hemodynamics, like I said, that's why we cycle the blood pressure every five minutes. Hemodynamics can be a pretty important thing to watch here. Uh, airway damage, we can cause lesions, edema, bleeding. And then obviously down here, this is the one you, your respiratory manager will pay a lot of attention to, is if the scope breaks and you did not use one of these bite blocks. <laughs> Use a bite block, right? Your manager will love you if you never break a scope. Even though it's technically the doctor that broke the scope, you're the one uh, in charge of making sure that scope, as much as possible, is kept uh, well well covered. So, so make sure. It's uh, thousands and thousands of dollars when that usually happens. Even if they have a contract to send it out. And then now you're down, your facility is down one more scope. Uh, and if you do a lot of scopes like we did at Swedish Man, it's going to be pretty detrimental to have one of your scopes down. All right, so here is some pictures that I sort of put in here at the end. So this is just like one of those little oral sections, like I said, I would put in there with the bite block. But I would hook this up to oxygen. So there's like oxygen tubing here, right? So I'd hook it up to this. So it would just deliver continuous oxygen through the procedure into the oral pharynx so that helps them stay oxygenated as well. Uh, obviously they're not going to bite on the tube <laughs> as likely. Uh, these are the forceps grasping a penny. So it also gives you sort of a scale about how big the bronchoscope is. And we usually tell the patients about the size of an eraser or a pencil, right? An eraser on a pencil. <laughs> so it's not big, but it's not incredibly small either. And so this is something that we have to look at, but you can see just grasping a penny how small those forceps are. So that's why you're looking at using something that small. Uh, it may have a hard time getting big, big objects out of the airway. And over here, this is an e-bus, the tip of an e-bus scope. And you can see this is a giant needle that comes out of there. Now, what happens here is you're going to put a little balloon on this tip there, and you're going to fill it with saline. <laughs> 
Um, and so the idea here is this is the ultrasound part. So this is where you'll be looking. And you're obviously going to want to see no blood flow. Because <laughs> if you poke a giant hole into something that has blood flow in the airway, it could be a pulmonary artery or an aorta or something like that. Massive bleed out. So we're going to use the ultrasound part. That's the EBUS, right? We're going to use the ultrasound part to look for lymph tissue, right? And so when we see the lymph tissue, then we're going to put this giant needle into there, into the lymph tissue, and we're going to core out a sample. And so you're going to take that sample, you're going to put it on a slide, and you're going to hand it to the pathologist. And ours was in the room, which was a life and time saver. Um, and you're going to push the core out into onto a slide, and they're going to look at the slide and look for things like cancer and things like that. So there's a lot to consider here, and I hope that you sort of enjoy just a little tiny introduction. I'm not going to expect you guys to memorize all of this stuff, but I just want you to sort of see what's going on so you're more familiar with it when you get to see it out there.